well, I can't think of a better way to start a service than baptisms. And uh, th- yeah. We're not just celebrating here in this room. We're also celebrating at the Hub because at the Hub today, we had a baptism in each of our services. And so it's a double tank Sunday, y'all. Yeah. Yeah. We went to DMB. We got another tank. It's just, I mean, that's, I don't know. There's a lot of things to celebrate. That's something that I gets this farm boy excited. And so being able to, to do that and for Brandon, the team there, to be able to celebrate that uh, in the room there. And, man, to have 11 or 12, I can't remember if it's 11 or 12 baptisms uh, today, people stepping out saying, I'm, I'm new in Christ. And uh, one of the baptisms earlier this morning um, He'd only been to church last Sunday. I was like, hey, you know, we got to get to know him one Sunday. What are you doing next week? He's not, not much. Want to get baptized? Yeah, sounds good, you know. And so being able to have that and see that take place in the second service today, another guy who's never been to Rock Harbor, never been to Rock Harbor, had a radical encounter with God last Sunday morning, called the church office at like 1 o'clock Sunday afternoon. Services were over. They said, if you want to come to Rock Harbor is, they have dessert. He's like, sounds good. He shows up. We have a conversation, and he was baptized in the second service today. So that's just something that we can celebrate. I know Brandon got to have a great conversation with Alec, and man, God is at work, and when he does things like that, that's that's when you know it's only God. God's the only one that can save. God's the only one that can draw a soul uh, to him. And so that's exciting. When you came in today, you were given a program. And on that is some notes and some weekly reading. We want to continue to not just read the Bible, but to engage with Scripture. Um, we're in week number five of Romans uh, 12, our Deeply Rooted series. And Deeply Rooted is more than just a, a five to six week uh, conversation about spiritual growth. It's actually our theme for the year. So this whole year we'll be referencing back to Romans 12, referencing what it means to be deeply rooted to the point that this September, so in about seven months uh, from now, we're going to do a series, a 10-week series called Rooted. And it's based out of um, with groups, we'll be aligning all of our groups and getting everybody together for 10 weeks to really press into what does it mean to, to really follow uh, Jesus. And so you community groups that are meeting right now, okay, we're going to be putting the pressure on because some of you are leading, some of you are attending, and we're going to press in to say we need more leaders. We're going to be looking for multiplication to take place in the roots of this body. And uh, we're excited to celebrate that even this week in groups, we had I think 13, 1,200 people sign up for community groups which is incredible, but we had almost 800 show up. That's amazing. To have 60% of our weekend uh, adult attendance to be part of a group, and I know that uh, maybe uh, some groups didn't meet last week because of just getting schedules out and all of that, but tonight they'd be meeting for some queso in a game, okay? Um, but we're very excited for the group life and living in community uh, together and pressing into this, this understanding of who is Jesus We talked about being rooted in our worship, being rooted in God's word, being rooted, as Brandon talked about, in our work as we serve the Lord last week in our walk and this week in our walk because we didn't get it the first time. So I'm just doing last week's message again. I'm not really. uh, But we're going to continue to press into uh, verse number 9 through 13 of Romans uh, 12. I'm going to read uh, verse number 9. I'll I'll just say it. I don't need to read it. But let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, and hold fast Uh, to what is good. We talked about what are we fixing our gaze upon, what are we fixing our glare upon, and then also what are we gripping in our life, our gaze, our glare, and our grip. And if you missed last week's message, I want to encourage you to please, please listen to it, watch it, go onto the app, um, share that with others. And here's why. It really hit us exactly where we need to be and where we are as a church. It's the core of of this walk, being rooted in our walk uh, with Jesus. And I don't know if you've ever been in a discussion with someone where you're kind of like either kind of ripping on each other a little bit, or maybe you're in an argument and you walk out of that time and you're thinking, oh, you think about the perfect comeback later, right? You're like, I should have said that. I could have burned them, you know? And maybe I've never been in a disagreement, um, but maybe you have, you know? And that's what happened when I came across this verse in Proverbs, like, darn it, that was perfect for last week's message. So let's read it anyways. I know it was last week, but it says, let your eyes look directly forward and then your gaze be straight before you. Ponder the path of your feet, then all your ways will be sure. Do not swerve to the right or the left. Turn your foot away from evil. Let our paths be straight. Fix our gaze on what's directly ahead of us. Don't turn to the right or the left. Let's be deeply rooted in what God has and what God desires for us. Okay, now on to this week's message. I'm done with that part. Uh, Verse 10. 
Love one another with a brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in the spirit. Serve the Lord. See, this is a call to action. This is a command that we've been given. This, this brotherly love that's talked about, it's, it's saying that because of the gospel of Jesus, because we are in the same family of God together, that we've been made one because of what God has done for us. We're, we're brothers and sisters. Siblings are so annoying, right? They're so difficult. They can be so challenging. But this brotherly affection that's talked about, it's not saying, hey, just kind of tolerate each other. Just let's make this brotherly love and just don't fight with each other kind of love. No, it's saying like fully engage with one another. We're different than one another, but we're to abide with one another. We're to dwell with one another. We're to be a root system that's connected to one another. So we see these 11 or 12 people be baptized today. Today isn't the day that they're surrendering their life to Christ. No, today's the day of celebration of that surrender. But what we're seeing, like, these are our brothers and sisters in Christ. They've been made new. We're to abide together. We're to have brotherly love for one another. A brotherly love is a love that lays down one life for another's life. Greater love has no man than this, Jesus said, than to lay down a life for a friend. Bless you. How many people, I don't know if you're at the hub, I don't know if it picked up that audio, but someone just go boosh, you know, but bless them, bless you at the hub as well, okay? Anybody that sneezes over the next two and a half hours, bless you. Um, but hey, how many of you guys have heard of Johnny Ash? Johnny Ash, a couple of people. Uh, in the first service, no one, okay? Uh, second service, about four, and in this service, about eight in this room. I'm sure the hub, you guys are so godly, you all know him. But Johnny Ash was in the military, and he served during the Vietnam War. War And he, he was in the Marines, uh, got his training, and he went out for a tour of duty for a year and put himself in harm's way for that year. And about three months left in his tour, he came before uh, his officers and said, I want to serve another tour. And they said, okay, you want to serve another tour? I mean, the, the tens and thousands, tens of thousands of, of men who, who died and offered their life as a sacrifice for our nation for freedom and, and all of that. And he said, I want to serve another tour. Well, that was kind of interesting, and, and, you know, there was a reason behind why he said, I want to serve another year. See, Johnny had a brother by the name of Arthur, and Arthur was a tennis player, and he had won a national championship at UCLA, and Arthur was attending, he was at West Point, and he was training up, but here's the thing. If a brother, Johnny, said, I want to serve another year term, they wouldn't send another brother out in harm's way. And so what he did, he said, I've served my one year, but I want to serve another year. I want to offer my life down for my brother. This gave Arthur the opportunity to do something that no African American has ed had ever done at the time. Johnny got back after his second tour just a short time before Arthur won the 1968 U.S. Open, becoming the first African American to do so. Johnny was able to witness that, be part of it. But here's the thing. Arthur thought that Johnny was serving another tour to become an officer. He didn't know that his brother was serving a tour because they wouldn't send two brothers out for fear that a family would lose two family members. He had no idea what was being done for him. Here's the thing. Brotherly love will lay down a life for one another. Brotherly love isn't just, I'm going to tolerate you. I'm going to put up with you. I'm going to share stuff with you. I'm going to do things to you as long as mom and dad aren't looking. <laughs> I'm going to ruin your, your life. No, brotherly love is I'm going to lay down my life for you. Greater love has no man than this, John 15, 13, than to lay down one's life for each other. Verse number 10 says, outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful. Outdo one another, to outserve. If you're going to be competitive, be competitive serving one another, outserving one another. Verse 13 says, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Be generous. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. So we've got generosity and hospitality mixed together. You know what that says? Give your stuff away, but more importantly, give yourself away. Generosity is giving our stuff away. Hospitality is giving our very self away. Generosity. 
I'm making a sacrifice of some of the things that I have. Hospitality. It's all yours, God. So I will let this life, this resource, this service, this time, everything you've given to me, I'm going to lay it down before you. See, hospitality often gets wrapped up into a spiritual gift. I don't have the gift of hospitality. Hey, because of my personality and the way I'm kind of designed, like hospitality. And then, then also I hear this a lot. Hospitality is kind of a girl thing. Like women have this gift of hospitality and men, you justify the fact that you can't clean a bathroom or no one can get in your car because they have to climb through things to get to it. Like, hey, it's just not a gift that I have. It's just not how I'm wired. No, in fact, hospitality actually reflects a sign of maturity in Jesus Christ. Because hospitality is more than having people over to your house. It's more than keeping a clean space so people can co come over and have that queso. It's more than I'm good at cleaning bathrooms and I create an environment, a warm environment, friendly. I let them in and then I never sit down and I stand in the back and I'm always thinking, hey, would you like a refill? Hey, how are you doing? Hey, is everybody good? Anybody would like some more Velveeta? Which, by the way, is so good. I don't even know. It's wrong. I'm going to get, I'm going to die someday because of Elvita, but I really like it, okay? And I hope somebody has it at our community group. They have it at their house. No pressure, but we probably should have it if we're going to have a good gathering. Be hospitable. Um, <laughs> but I also think, like, we start to justify why we don't do this calling. It says, seek. Seek it. One translation says, be innovative. Be creative with hospitality. It's this philozena. This is a love of strangers. We're providing provision for someone. We're providing fellowship. And in reality, when we provide hospitality, you know what we're doing? We're providing safety. We're telling someone else you can rest. When they're lonely, they don't have things, they don't have people maybe around them. When you extend hospitality, which is more than opening your home, it's opening your heart and your life. You're saying, you have a safe place in me. You can trust me. I care about you more than I care about myself. I'm offering myself, probably the hundredth time you've heard this in five weeks, I'm offering myself as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is my reasonable act of service. For I want to know and I want to do the will of God, this acceptable, good, and perfect will of his. So my act of worship is being hospitable to you. So whether or not I test it out on the hospitality, you know, spiritual gift test, I'm a follower of Jesus. I will open my heart. I will open my hands to you. Because in 250 A.D. to 270 A.D., there was a plague that had broke out in the Roman Empire. There was everything from measles, there was sickness going around, there was the black plague, there's all this stuff that's, that's taking place. What Smallpox was another thing. There's sickness that had run rampant, there was pollution within the water, there was a lack of food, and guess what people were doing? People were limiting their contact for what they might contract. They were limiting their contract contact with all of these people that had the plague. But guess what? There was a group of people that did things differently. There was a group of people back then called Christians. Now they're called followers of Jesus. Some people still call them Christians, but here at Rock Harbor, we define the difference between a Christian and a follower of Jesus. If you've been here much of any time, and I don't want this part to be picked up online and people go, mm, Pastor Keith said don't be a Christian. I didn't say that. I said be a follower of of Jesus and being a Christian sometimes is just a blanket term we kind of throw over this relationship with God or a group of people and in fact we're to follow Jesus and be active in our brotherly love for one another our Philadelphia that's where brotherly love comes from Philadelphia the city of brotherly love I don't I don't know that they love other people they love each other and they've kind of gotten away from the Greek definition of it but anyways they exist and God bless you, Tyson Louie, um, and a few others in this room that let your team and your people, but you don't, you're mean. Um, but it's this brotherly love that I'm willing to do whatever it takes to minister to people. And guess what the Christian did in that day and time? Those followers of Jesus, they ran to the plague. They gave care. They gave comfort to the point of burial. That's what historical records say. 
They gave care. They gave comfort to the point of burial. They honored. They outdid one another in showing honor. All the while, they were being persecuted. So they were being persecuted for who they followed. Then they were being shunned because they could contract whatever it was, and they pushed their comfort aside, and they said, I trust God more than I'm concerned for what I might actually get. I'm going to run to the plague. And my question for every one of us in this room and every one of us watching online, every one of us over at the Hub is this. In your life, how are you running to the plague? Think about that for you. Don't think about your family. Don't think about a spouse or a friend or something of your past. How are you right now in your life running to the plague? Is there a reason? Is there one way that you're running to the plague? Is there two ways? Maybe these two things I'm running to the plague. See, a follower of Jesus runs to the plague, but a Christian, they run to their own safety. They create a barrier for themselves and they protect themselves. See, see a follower of Jesus, they love their city. They love the Lord and they love their city. A Christian loves their people. They create a group of people, they create a, a circle of people, and they kind of serve each other, serve one another. They're scared of the city, but they've got this safe thing that they've put together, their safeties. A follower of Jesus puts himself out there. For what they may contract, they're willing to contact because the plague doesn't have a, a hold over them, doesn't rule, doesn't reign in their life. See, a Christian... <laughs> They schedule their life. They put things together in their life. And they kind of push maybe those God moments out because there's not a lot of margin because they put in a, a schedule of how they want their life to look and what they want their time to look like and what they want their family schedule and structure to look like. There's not much margin for God to do something like those God moments. A follower of Jesus is very intentionally available. If something comes up, it's going to get a priority. It doesn't mean that we're always late to everything because we're just serving the Lord. No, you took forever to get your hair done, okay? Don't say that was serving God, okay? It's not an excuse as to why we can arrive late, but it means if something comes up, we're going to take the time. We're going to do whatever it takes to meet that need. We're not going to dishonor people and make people wait around and just use that as a blanket excuse statement. Hey, I was tardy because I was serving Jesus. But rather... Our schedule is flexible. Our eyes are lifted to follow the Lord, to outdo one another in showing honor. You know, there's some practical ways that I've seen take place in the almost seven years of Rock Harbor, and I see people making sacrifice and outdoing one another in showing honor. And I want to say this real quick before I go into this, this list, that we don't hear it in a way of guilt. So if you hear something, it's not like you should feel horrible because somebody did this. No, no, we're to stir one another up. I think it's worthy of celebrating these things that I'm going to share. The first one is a park and prayer, a park and prayer. These are people who park far away from the building, and on their way in, they pray for the type of day. They pray for the people that are going to be here. They're praying for other things. They're praying. They're like, God, I know, like, I'm parking. I'm creating space. So like, families, young moms, whatever the thing would be, they could park up close the first time, people that haven't come before, but I'm going to park away, create some space, and I'm going to walk a distance on my way in. Those people over at the hub, you hubbers, you park in that gravel lot that's a half a block away. You walk through, your shoes gets messed up, you're dodging puddles, you're getting agile so you can worship the Lord as you walk your way up that sidewalk, and you pray on your way in. Maybe you're praying that somebody doesn't sideswipe you on Meridian Road. I don't know, but you're praying on your way in. You're praying for the hearts and souls of people because it's not about you, and that's how you start your day. We also got some Sunday scooters around here. Some Sunday scooters. These are people that when Nate comes up and, hey, 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 could you scoot towards the middle? Hey, everybody, hey, 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 scoot on in as you greet one another. Would you scoot on in? You scoot on in. You're not, you're willing to go like, okay, I don't know them. We'll meet in the middle across the old Georgia line. You're doing this and you don't know how you're going to get there, but you're willing to scoot in and to make room so that people 
can have a place to sit. You've, some of you have scooted to the 815 service. You're here today because you're watching somebody be baptized. You happen to work out your schedule or whatever it might be. You're Velveeta. You got your Velveeta on the crock pot, and so it worked a little bit better to come to this service. But some of you have scooted to the 815. Some of you have scooted to the noon. And some of you scooted over to the hub. And you know why you did so? You scooted and you made room so that one more life can be made room for. One more soul one more eternity could have a place. One more family had room, and you scooted. You're a Sunday scooter. Some of you are early arrivers and late leavers. There are some people that got here at like 6, crack of 30 this morning, and they're setting up, and they're doing all, they're an early arriver. I saw this one lady this morning at 7.39. She walked in. She's like, how you doing in Jesus? And I was like, whoa, she crazy. Like, I'm, I'm like, I mean, I had one Dutch. She had four, okay? She had four Dutch bros. She's on her way in. She's just excited. She's going back to her host area, and I'm like, I need to go write my message, you know? Like, good to see you. I got to head back here. Uh, but she was just excited, and I see this early arriving. Like, I want to be there. I'm walking in. I'm looking for people that I can serve. It's some of you guys who get here a little bit early. You see someone behind you in that kid check-in line, you know? And rather than boxing them out and keeping them out of there so you can go you know, get all in. You're like, hey, you have four kids. I have two. Four is greater than two. My math is good. My heart is better. You go ahead, okay? <laughs> you go ahead. For real. How many of you guys took your kids, if you, you checked in kids, they went to more than two environments today. You have to go to two or more rooms to get your kids to the certain places. A decent amount of you. Wow. You got to check your steps when you leave this place, okay? You have to get here early because you will arrive late if you don't, right? And you got to get to the, all these rooms and get to these places. I can't think of a better layout for a church than this school. It's almost like when the planners of a Meridian City, they were talking about what they wanted to do with Rocky Mountain High School, and they were like, what if we did it like this? And God's like, I'm going to let them think it's a school, but it's going to be war- perfect for a church. Because you can't get a better layout than we currently have. Now, it would be great if the rooms were about three times the size of them, okay? Because all y'all are fertile, and you've been having kids and filling them up. And it would be nice to have coffee in here, too. Hub, quiet. Hub's like, you know, drinking it back right now. But I'll tell you this, we're blessed with what we've been given. And when we come in here, we arrive early, and we stay late, we get this opportunity to minister to people. See, An early arriver and a late leaver, because there's some people that are here until like 2 o'clock serving and making it happen and doing whatever it takes. They show up to share, not arrive to acquire. They show up to share, not arrive to acquire. How about the lonely lookers? Not that they look lonely, but they look for the lonely. The lonely lookers, when they walk around, they're looking for people. They're looking for that face. It doesn't take a whole lot of social awareness to recognize who might feel comfortable, who might know someone, who might be connected to someone. But they walk into a lobby and they walk, you know what, let me stop for a second. We walk into a room one of two ways. You either walk into a room and say, I'm here, and you wait for people to come to you, or you walk into a room and you say, you're here. And you look around and you say, hey, hey, they don't know people. Hey, I'm going to say hi to them. Hey, how are you doing today? It's great to see you. Hey, is this your first time? No, I've been going here four years. Oh, awesome. It's great to see you. I've been going here two and a half. I guess we don't know each other. I'd rather say hi for the 10th time than say hi for the zeroth time. It's not even a word, but whatever. But a lonely looker says, hey, how can I make a connection? Because some of you are community connectors. You're community creators. Wherever you go, you're creating community. That you may have a group and you may have your connection, but you have an inviter focus, not an insider focus. You have an inviter focus, not an insider focus. That if this is your community and your group and the things that you have, you don't go, okay, this is my group. I got to play defense. I'm an insider. I'm, I'm, I'm keeping, hey, good to see you. Hey, thanks for coming. Good to see you, but this is my group. You're not thinking us four no more. You're not like, mm, mm, I got some friends. This is my friend. Hey, how you doing? Good to see you. Welcome to Rock Harbor. You know, you're not doing that. No, you're here. You're turned inside. You're having relationships, but you're looking outside, and you're inviting people in. And you're, Doesn't mean you're inviting them into your group. Maybe your group don't have room. 
You have so many kids coming to your group, there's no more room for anybody else's hoodlums. You have no more room for them. I understand that. But you're going to have a conversation. Say, hey, are you in a group? Hey, I'd love to connect. Hey, you would like a men's group? Hey, hey, man, do you, do you lead a group? No, I don't. Maybe God's leading you to lead a group, and this guy could be in it. May, I think God is speaking to me. And then just like that, we have another group. Somebody's connected, okay? This is what community connectors do. They're looking for ways that they can serve because they have an inviter focus, not an insider focus. I should have stopped at three points, but I literally could not stop. We got to five. Let's get back to chap chapter 12, verse 11. Okay. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in the Spirit. Serve the Lord. Do not be slothful in zeal. How many of you had held a sloth? Two of us. It's weird. It's really weird. On our honeymoon, I held a sloth. That did, I, not my wife. I, there was another time for other, th there was a time she took a picture of me holding this animal that is disgusting. Touching the, it's like, oh my goodness. Like, I want to throw up thinking about it. It moves slowly. It just creeps. And I'm thinking if all of a sudden this animal, this beast gets energy, it's going to maul my face off. It's got talons. And I don't even know if it should have talons. Maybe it's a claw. I don't know. It's like this. It's so disgusting. So when I read this passage and it says, don't be slothful, I'm like, no problem. I don't want to be slothful. Like, that's disgusting. Don't be slothful in your zeal, your passion. Be fervent in your spirit. Serve the Lord. You know where zeal comes from? It comes from being deeply rooted in God. You may say, I'm just not an extroverted person. I just don't get really that excited. I'm not like exuberant. Like I don't have, like those are gifts that I don't have. No, 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 no. Zeal is not a spiritual gift. Zeal takes work and it comes from the ground up. It comes from what we are rooted in that begins to fill us. It doesn't mean you have to express yourself like everyone else would that happens to be extroverted or loud or, you know, just doesn't matter. They, they just get excited and they tell everybody about it. They're an evangelist. They're, they're very, you know, pumped up about stuff. What zeal means is it's inside of you because you're deeply rooted in him. Our mission statement specifically, it comes down to this Romans 12, 9 through 13. To love and lead one another to be devoted followers of Jesus. We talked about it last week, what we would love genuinely. Love genuinely. And then you know how we would lead? We would lead with zeal. We would love genuinely and we would lead with zeal. We'd be passionate. We'd be excited. In fact, here's how zeal is defined. It's, a, it's spode. It means with speed, with haste, with diligence, earnestness, enthusiasm, eagerness. This eagerness. You want, you want more zeal in your life? Serve the Lord. We don't get zeal by serving ourselves. No, we get temporary satisfaction and joy that doesn't fuel us for much other than that act or a short period of time. But when you serve other people, oh, that starts a fire in you. That fuels you. I had a friend pass away about four months ago. My friend's name is, is Curtis and this last six months of his life, I got to be a part of it. I got to see him walk through some challenges in his health and, and literally until death. Christine, John, other staff, we're spending time, we're talking, we're getting to pray with them and spend these very like cherished moments. And what I witnessed in Curtis's life, the more that his body weakened, the stronger his zeal became. I watched it happen. The zeal and passion that was inside of him. I remember John and I went to the house one day and we knock on the door and uh, he uh, says, he didn't answer at first, and so I'm like, oh, don't want to wake him up. I know he's not feeling great. Let's knock again. I knock again. He's like, come in. I'm like, the door's locked, broski. He's like, come in. I'm like, the door's locked, broski. Can you come get ski, me, ski, and ski? You know, like, we can't get in. And so he's like, hold on. And I hear him get up, and he had this hardwood 
on his floor. When he walked over, he got the door, and I walked in to give him a hug, and he literally fell into my arms. I'm like, I was just going for a hug, but I think he wanted to dance. And so we're just like skating around, and I'm sliding a little bit, and he's sliding, and I'm like, oh, bro. He's like, just hold me for a second. I'm like, okay, I hold him for a second. And John's like, can I get in on this? John Lake's in there like, like, bro, hook a brother up, you know? And I'm like, come get a Curtis sandwich, you know? And so we just give him a hug, and then we lift him over to his recliner. And all of a sudden, he just comes alive. I'm like, you were just asleep. You just collapsed in our arms, and now you are on fire. I know I've heard of power naps, but this was like a whole nother level. And the zeal began to come out. And we drove 35 minutes to his house to minister to him and to minister to his family. And we got preached at, and we got called up. And zeal was transferred from someone whose body was wasting away, but the life of Jesus Christ was coming alive in them. And they were getting weaker, but their zeal was getting stronger, for heaven was closer than it had ever been. That is zeal. That is enthusiasm. That's what we're to stir one another up for. And he's sitting there, and I'm watching him and his body and this life that we know, this temporary life, wither away. But because of his roots, it was springing forth some of the greatest fruit that I've been able to witness in my life. That's seal. That's not a spiritual gift that some people have. That's what we have availability for. And his zeal sparked a zeal in me. And now I say things like, I'm not going to let nobody steal my zeal. Because I saw it alive in him. Verse 12 says that we should rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, and be constant in prayer. See, this hope that's talked about in the Bible is different than the hope that we express in our culture. Because we say things like, I hope it doesn't rain today. I hope you have a good day. I hope you're doing well. I hope the Patriots lose. We say stuff like that. I heard that amen. This is a godly church. But I also know the Bible, when it describes hope, it says it's an expectation of good. In fact, it's a confident assurance that is based in the character of God. The hope that we hold is based in the character of God. It's different than I wish. It's different than kind of praying toward. No, no, it's a constant in prayer. It's patient in tribulation, and it's held up in the character of God. In fact, Hebrews 6 says it this way, For it's impossible for God to lie, for we have fled for refuge, that we might have a strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope that's set before us. A strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope the much longed for encouragement that can only come from God. It's set before us, let's aspire for us, that we would have this sure and a steadfast, a deeply rooted, steadfast anchor for our soul. So we won't be tossed to and fro with any wind of doctrine or tossed around like the chaff of wickedness. No, we're firm and steadfast. When the waters come, we will not be moved for we are sunk deep into that soil. We have the nutrients that come from only God. And this hope that we have, it enters into this inner place that's behind the curtain. It's an eternal hope. So we can keep on stepping even when things get difficult. When we're lied to, we can press on. When we're suffering, we're not shaken. For tribulation, Jesus said, will come into this world. But I've come that I might give you peace. He brings a peace. He is the anchor for us. The Bible often talks about not wavering. Not wavering, not living unswervingly. Not Remember the verse, Proverbs 4? Not to the right, not to the left, but fixed, straight ahead. That we would endure tor- torture like that early church that went after and chased the plague. We would endure whatever tor- torture, whatever persecution might come. And in fact, when it defines this without wavering, this steadfast, this anchored soul that we are to have, it says that we would endure torture. It also says that this in itself is a loyal man. When you are steadfast, you are a loyal man. Men, are you loyal? Are you loyal to the King of Kings? Are you loyal to our gracious God who's given everything for you? 
Are you loyal to him that your generosity and your hospitality and your grace and your love brings honor and glory to him? Are you a loyal man? Are you a loyal follower of Jesus? See, men and women, when you lead, you lead out of the overflow of your following. Where your gaze, where your glare, where your grip is, we follow that direction and you lead out of that following. And discipleship is not solely based in leadership. You know what? It's deeply rooted in fellowship. Discipleship isn't about who am I leading. It's not about leadership. I'm a leader. People pride themselves. They say stuff like that. What kind of follower are you? Discipleship is about fellowship. And we've got to be rooted in following him. I need you, and you need me. And we are knit together. We are rooted together. In fact, I have a question for you. How many of you have heard of the Pando Aspen Grove? It's about 11 hours from us. It's in Utah. I haven't been there. I'm going to go there someday. This grove is the largest living organism in the world. It's all one. It's 107 acres. It's like 13 billion pounds of tree and root. It's all connected together. It's the oldest. It's the largest. 140, or no, 47,000 aspen trees make up this grove. And it's on the verge of extinction. You know why? Is it because of drought? No. Is it because of bugs? No. Some sort of affliction, some sort of sickness, has it come into the soil? No. There's no baby trees. That's why. These aspen trees live 80 to 90 years. It's on the verge of extinction. There's no little saplings coming up. Well, they come up, but guess what? There's 50 mule deer that call this place home, and they eat up those small trees because that's how they survive. That whole story to let you know Bambi is killing the forest. No, and also there's a cattle drive that happens every spring. Some family has laid claim and has rights to graze and move cattle, this huge cattle drive. They've had it for over 100 years. It comes through and eats, cows eat up these small saplings and all this, and they've done all this research on what they can do, and the answer is this. This forest will die if young trees don't grow. I need you and you need me. 80 to 90 years on an aspen tree, 80 some to 90 years for us. And what are you doing with your walk? And what are you doing with your life? See, a partially devoted follower of Jesus in this generation will make a non-surrendered, abandoned, maybe a, somebody that calls himself like a Christian, but not sold out. My zeal, my protection, me be, being willing to scoot for someone to scoot over, to serve, to arrive early, to stay late, me to invite rather than inside, all that stuff produces. All that stuff is multiplication. This never gets old. It never gets old watching someone be baptized. It never gets old watching someone's new life in Jesus Christ come alive. And my question for you is this. Is your zeal alive is your zeal the real deal, or is your zeal on the verge of extinction? Because you're kind of follow, you're kind of connected, you're kind, or are you sold out because nothing else on this earth matters than the eternity we have in Jesus Christ? And are we sharing that with other people? Are we rooted in what actually matters? Because therein lies the hope of the world. The expectation of God's character that he is faithful, he's just, he'll forgive us, he'll call us, he'll direct us, he'll lead us, and he'll uphold us. So be steadfast, be constant in your prayer, be firm in your foundation, be deeply rooted in him. For the next generation, 
is relying on you and I's faith. What are you rooted in and what are you walking towards? Would you bow your heads with me? God, you bought your word to us today to bring strength, to bring hope, to bring life. For some, to bring them to a relationship with you. For some, to renew a focus, to renew a passion, for a zeal to be stirred up. Let us be steadfast and constant. Thank you for the grace that comes only from you. The forgiveness that comes from you. God, we want our zeal to stir up. I know we need one another. Let our roots be knit together, but not on the surface. Press down into you. Let us hold up one another as we hold up you and your word, your instruction for life. Let us have hope as scripture talks about hope. God, we don't want the next generation to be in full rebellion because we've been in half commitment. Thank you for the zeal that was carried out by your only son. Let it fill us today, for we are yours, and we want to be rooted in you. It's by your name we pray. Amen.